Hello, MCC Church family. We're the Mayas. I'm Matt. I'm Bryce. I'm Everly, and it's happy to open up church again. <laughs> and I'm Shay, and this is Scuffy. And I'm Skye. Uh, we've missed our church family so much the past few months, and we're really looking forward to the summer and getting to see everybody again. Bye. <laughs> Bye. So happy to be here. Hello, Hello church, church family. family. I'm Jason. I'm Kimberly. I'm Jay. I'm Bella. I'm Rosie. <laughs> I'm Adam. We, we miss, miss you. you. We miss you all. I miss you guys. I'm going to Canada to be with my fiance and I'm going to miss my church family. See you soon. Look forward to seeing you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Hello, church family. We're the Dyers. I'm Kelly. I'm Justine. And this is Liam. Can you say hi? Liam, look, can you say hi? We miss you all so much. We can't wait to be back together again soon. Today we will be reading from Romans 2 verse 17 through 24 and verse 29. If you're using a church Bible that is on page 940, I'll give you a moment to turn there. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Skipping to verse 29. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Welcome, MCC, and wherever you're hearing this today, we're in Romans. We're in Romans chapter 2, so if you got a Bible or your phone, we ask you to join with us. We're looking at being insufficient. Remember, Paul is building a case in chapters 1, 2, and 3, that we're inadequate or insufficient to earn our way to heaven. And he's dealing with non-religious and religious people. We use those terms because he's talking about people who grew up with the Bible or who go to church or who know a little bit about God, whatever it might be, and people who know nothing or, or grew up in an atheist home or, or grew up in the jungle somewhere. You often hear, what about the people in the jungle? He's dealing with both groups. Now, both groups are Jews and Gentiles are pushed together in this little church and he's saying to both of them, you are insufficient and inadequate to go to heaven on your spiritual resume. My spiritual resume before God would not be good enough, and neither would yours. That's what he's building a case about. Now, I realized I was inadequate and insufficient for a lot of things in early in life, but especially in fifth grade when we were in PE class and the boys were uh, going against the girls. And when it came up to my turn, I was running against one of the strongest and biggest girls, sometimes the girls uh, have outgrown boys in that time period, and and we took off to race, and she, well, she smoked me. She she just embarrassed me, and I was very inadequate. Uh, later on in high school, I asked her out, and she said no. She didn't give me a reason. I guess she didn't want to go out with somebody that she could outrun or beat up. So I was very inadequate for that. You know, if you stand before God today, if you died today, and you said, well, I did my best. I tried hard. I was sincere. I worked at it. It wouldn't be enough to change your heart towards God. It, that's Paul saying the whole thing is not externals or not sincerity or being our best. He's saying everything builds around the two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul's going to say, and he's going to propose in the book of Romans, you have to have a changed heart to change nature inside of you by the Holy Spirit to be able to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. He's teaching what Jesus taught. Matter of fact, when Jesus said that, that you got to love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, he was being tested by a Jewish lawyer, not a lawyer that would sue you, but a person that took all the commandments that Judaism created, 
they would show how to apply them in daily life, over 600. And so he's testing Jesus, which of those commandments is the best, or which ones would he pick out of, of all those 600 and something laws? And Jesus said, there's only two commandments. You got to love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul is saying that we're all inadequate in that way and we need God to change us. Now, that's why last week we said in Romans 1.16 that he was wanting to preach the gospel, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ so that everyone would have a chance to believe whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. You remember last week he said, I'm eager, I'm unashamed, and I owe a debt to everybody, a debt of love. I'm eager to proclaim Christ because what he did in my life, I'm unashamed of him, and I owe a debt to people to reach them. And so chapter 2, he's still building this case that all of us need Christ, whether we're religious, non-religious, whatever home we grew up in, male, female, black, white, whatever our uh, status is in life, we need a change of heart that comes by the risen Christ. He wants you to put your trust in Christ. So the first word that he deals with in this chapter is condemned. So if you're at home or wherever you are, just say it to yourself or say it with somebody condemned. That's a strong word. He says we stand condemned because we cannot change our own nature. We can't change our own nature by being a good person. Chapter 2, verse 1, therefore, he picks up from what he's built the case in Romans 1 that all of us know better, all of us are without excuse, but all of us have made ourselves our own God. We have went our own way, done our own thing. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who judges and passes judgment on another. He said, once you pass judgment, you condemn yourself because you practice the same thing. So he starts off with the religious people and uh, he says to them, I hear some of you are judging. That means past sentence. And this word right here in this phrase, it means to condemn or past sentence. He said, you're condemning other people and you're passing sentence. You're saying, well, I know they're going to go to hell. I know they'll never be there because they're not as good as me. And you're condemning and passing sentence. And he says, you're condemning and passing sentence on yourself. Because why? Because you practice the same thing. Now, Claudius, the Roman emperor, had removed all the Jews out of Rome just a few years before that. Now, the Jewish people are coming back into Rome and the Jewish Christians are back. So now the Jewish Christians are having to learn to live with the Gentile Christians. That would be like uh, uh, Penn State fans and Pittsburgh fans getting along, that kind of thing, or Pittsburgh fans and Cleveland Brown fans, whatever it might be. And, and now you've got to live together and get along together. And actually, it's worse than that because they thought one group, the Jews thought the Gentiles were just pagans and not worth anything. So now they're learning to live together. And he says, I want you to be united in the gospel and live together. And he says, there's a group of you that keep passing sentence on other people. Now, Jesus said that we can judge righteously in John 7. To judge righteously is to look at somebody's fruit, their lifestyle, their words, but we don't pass final sentence on them. We don't, we don't condemn them. Paul says you're condemning yourself by practicing the same things that you, that you judge other people about and look down on them about. David Kenneman, he wrote a book called Unchristian, and he said, when they asked people on the outside, on the outside of the faith to look in, he said many of the on the outside are saying modern day Christian Christianity doesn't seem to be very Christian. They said it's not what Jesus intended. Now, here's people who don't know much about Christ and they're looking in at the church and they're saying, hey, there's some people we see watching them. They don't seem to be following Jesus. And it's clear, he said, that if you look at the life of Jesus, he preferred the company of sinners over the so-called saints because the so-called saints put on airs, harshly judged him, and sought to trap him. In the end, it was the so-called saints, he said, with the help of Rome who put him to death and not the sinners who, are, who arrested him. And then he said, we found out people with a true godly biblical worldview were substantially different from the world and from those who proclaimed to be believers. And so he said, if you really follow Christ, he said, we found out you tend to stand out. That's what Paul is saying to this group of people. He's saying, I hope 
that you will not pass sentence on people, but you'll want to get the gospel to them. He's going back to Romans 1.16. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Preach the gospel to yourself. Get the gospel out. The world doesn't need to be judged. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world. He said, it's already judged by its behavior, its lifestyle, it's what it loves. He said, I came to save the world. And so Paul is picking right up there. Verse 2, he said, we all know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. So those who are judgmental and harsh and don't want to see the world saved, while all the time proclaiming they're okay with God, he said, you know and I know God's judgment's going to come on such a thing who practices such thing in verse 3. Verse 4, he said, you're presuming, you're presuming on God's kindness. It's God's kindness that lets you live today. It's God's grace that saved you if you really were saved. How could you be so judgmental against those who aren't like you? Why do you not want to reach them, he says. You notice three times, three times he says, those who practice these things. He says, again, you're saying one thing, but you're you're behaving in another way. You're practicing these things. Verse 5, it's because of your hard and unrepentant heart that you're storing up for yourself wrath, God's righteous anger, on the day of judgment when it's all revealed. He said, I want to remind you, it's not so much God's against you. He is against you, but it's you're against God. Your, your heart is building up judgment for that day. Now, I have a cousin who married... Uh, a man who uh, invented uh, one of the artificial hearts, a titanium heart and some other things. He was big in robotics, uh, made a fortune. I don't know them very well, but I know they're related to me, so I might need to write him an email one day and ask him for some money or something. But he's done really well. So I looked up what it was about the artificial heart, uh, how it got started, what, what a need for it. And here, what was the need for it in the beginning? Here's the phrase that caught me. It is, this is for people, he said, that have significant heart failure, who need long-term support, who need a new heart that will, quote, prove to be better than the one you were born with. Prove to be better than the one you were born with, he said, because the one we're born with is often insufficient to get us all the way to the end. He, Paul said, hey, the heart you have is insufficient to love God and love your neighbor. You need a new heart. Jesus said, you must be born again. You need Christ living inside of you. I'm going to unashamedly ask you, put your trust in Jesus Christ, not yourself. Let him change you. Let him forgive you of, his, of your sins, but also let him come in and be inside of you. Let him be Lord of your life. Paul said, there's some religious people in this church, religious people. He said, that's all you got. You got religion. You don't have a relationship with Christ. The second word I want to talk about is justice. So just say justice to someone at home. He says, God is going to treat everybody with justice. He said, some of us are standing condemned before God because we say one thing and we practice another. But he said, God will treat everybody with fairness, everybody with justice. In verse 6, he says, God will render each one according to his works. And he goes on to say, some, in verse 8, are obeying uh, the truth, and some obey unrighteousness. Some are self-seeking, but some love God. And there will be a day of justice, wrath, and fury. God's righteous anger will come quickly on the earth, and it will judge every man and woman. And he says, some are doing evil, some are doing good in verse 10, and in verse 11, God shows no partiality. Now, some people use that verse and they use it in a wrong way, and they say, God loves everybody, he does this and that, and he shows no partiality. But the context of this phrase right here is that when we stand before God, he will show no partiality in evaluating, judging every person's heart. Everybody will have everything revealed. And for us as Christians, the main thing that will be revealed is that we put our trust in Christ and we said, I can't save myself. I can't be good enough to the world that, that brags on their own trying, their own sincerity, their own religion. Everything will be revealed and there'll be no partiality. God will treat everybody the same. In Matthew 25, Jesus said, your works and your words show what you really love. And he said, one group will stay on one side of him 
and one group will be on the other side, and he'll look at all of our words and all of our works, our deeds, and he said it will reveal that one group loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loved their neighbor and themselves, and the other one it will reveal that they were self uh, glorifying and self-sufficient and love themselves. He said, our words and our lifestyle eventually will reveal what we really love. That's what Paul is talking about. Now, let me be clear here. Paul uses the whole book of Romans to say we're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. But Paul's always saying it's faith, it's faith alone, but faith is never alone. If you're saved by faith, there'll be a a change in your words. There'll be a change in your lifestyle. There'll be a change in what you think about. There'll be a change in how you see people, how you love people, how you treat them. He said, there'll be a real transformation. But he said, God will one day come and judge all of us in fairness and in justice. By the way, this is a good reminder. The gospel is for everybody. It's for believers and non-believers. It's not just for unbelievers that we get the gospel to them. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves and to each other, the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul is reminding them that in this church, some of them have forgotten the gospel of how they got saved, how they got changed by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, not by works or good deeds or by being sincere. You remember Charles Blondin, you, you remember the story where he walks across the tightrope in Niagara Falls and he asks people to come with him and uh, one in one session that he went across, he actually cooked an omelet. I think it was he cooked dinner or something, an omelet or something on a tightrope. He just went out there above the falls and cooked himself something to eat. And then he took a wheelbarrow and he said, who wants to get in with me? Of course, nobody wanted to do that. But his manager ended up getting on his back. I think one of the first people ever to do this outdoors, he got on his back and let him carry him across the tightrope. You see, that's what faith is. Faith says, I'm going to put my complete trust in you, Jesus, who you are and what you did for me at the cross, that your blood shed for me pays for my sin debt and that your life being placed in me changes my nature and changes my desires and changes me. I want, I want to invite you in. I, I put my whole trust in you. Paul said, unfortunately, some people here are in the church but they don't know the one who created the church. They don't know the one who died for the church. They don't know the one who gave his life for them. That'd be a tragic thing, wouldn't it? Go to church all your life, be religious, read the Bible some, try to be a good person, whatever, and get before God. And God said, I never knew you. We, we didn't have a relationship. That's what Paul is dealing with here. Third is motives. So he says, some people are standing condemned here. And uh, he's, again, building a, building a case. They're standing condemned because they're religious but don't have a relationship with Christ. Justice will come to all people, no partiality. Wherever you are on the earth, you'll be judged for the truth that you have, the light that you have. And then he says, motives will be revealed. It's all coming down to motives, why we do what we do. Are we living to show God is glorious, to show that we love God with all our heart? We fail in that sometimes. We have mixed motives sometimes. But as you grow in Christ, That'll become more of your passion. I want to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want to love my neighbor as myself. When I was in seminary, I had a professor that would meet with me, and he would disciple me some. And, and one day he was reading a passage of Scripture. He'd been in the faith for 40, 50 years. He, a brilliant teacher, helped write uh, one of the Bibles that, that are famous. Uh, all the notes are in the bottom. And he began to weep. And he began to weep over reading again that Jesus Christ died for him. He loved him with all of his heart. That'll become true about you. He said all of our motives one day will be exposed and out in the open. And was there, uh, was, was there sufficient evidence that we loved God with all our heart and loved our neighbor as ourself? So verse 12, he said, all have sinned. Now remember, sin is to love something or someone more than God. It's not about doing right or wrong or, or not doing something. Those are just the results. To sin is to love something or someone more than God. All have sinned. And some have sinned without the law. They never heard of the Bible. They never heard of Jesus. They're just out there somewhere, and, and the Jews called them the pagans. And he said, some have sinned without the law. 
and some have sinned under the law, and they'll be judged by the law. So again, he says, whether you're religious or non-religious, whether you grew up in church or didn't, he said, God will treat you just the same, whether you grew up in the jungle or the Bible Belt. He said, you'll be judged by what light you have, what truth you have. But he said, one day, everybody's motives will be exposed. What's down deep in the heart. Verse 13, for it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous, but it's those who do the law, who put it to practice, who believe it enough to act on it. They're justified. They're declared righteous. Verse 14, Gentiles who don't have the law, they sometimes do by nature what is in the law. So we hear those stories all the time. A man dies in an in a army platoon and he dies for his fellow man, his other soldiers, or someone goes in a house and rescues someone. A fireman goes in a house and rescues someone and he dies rescuing someone. And he said, sometimes the Gentiles who don't know much about God at all, they do things because they're made in the image of God that show what God is really like. So he said, it's going on everywhere that people know better. That He's just, again, building a case. And he says in 15, everybody's conscience is bearing witness. Verse 16, one day God will judge the secrets of every person through Christ Jesus. So that is the case here he builds. He said, just look at your motives. Do you more and more do what you do because you want to make God, God look glorious to other people? You want to show that he's weighty, worthy to you. That's what he's saying here. Look at your motives. Is that any desire of your heart at all? You remember uh, Bono who was with you too. I don't even know if they're still singing or not, but back in the day, he was uh, a, uh, a big attraction. Thousands of people would come and see the band. He said he was on stage one time and he said it began to hit him that he had to have the approval of 70,000 people. And he said, nobody would have known it. He said, I put on a good show. We did great. Uh, people enjoyed it. But he said, my motive down deep was, he said, I started to wonder, why do I have to have these people approve of me? Why do I have to have them cheer? Why do I have to have them accepting, accepting me? And he said, down in my heart, I began to realize my motives weren't quite right. You know, maybe God's revealing that to you. that You're, be you're beginning to see that there's nothing in life that'll count unless your heart desire is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbors yourself. Now, we're not talking about absolute perfection, right? You just shoot up in the sky and you do it right every time. But we are talking about continual direction, that it's a continual way of life for you. That's what Paul is addressing here. Is that your heart desire? Fourth, he deals with hypocrisy. He says, I want to deal with this thing called hypocrisy that some of you, he said, are saying one thing and living another way while judging other people that you think are less than you. So he says in verse 17, some of you are calling yourself a Jew. Just think religious person. You're calling yourself a religious person and you rely on the law and you boast in God. That's the problem. They rely on trying to do the law, trying to do their best while they say God is their God. So they're mixing the two. They got a little bit of God and a whole lot of trying. These religious people are doing a whole lot of trying. Verse 18, you know His will. You approve what is excellent. Verse 19, you think yourself a guide to the blind. Uh, verse 20, you uh, think you're an instructor of the foolish. You're a teacher of children. Verse 21, you who teach others, do you teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You say, don't commit adultery. Do you ever commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you ever rob temples? I think it's their coveting, the gold and the things in the temples. So he said, if you say these things and you practice something different, it's very confusing. And so to these religious, proud people, he said, I, I want to address your hypocrisy. Now, Paul was this way, and that's why it bothers him, I think, so much. He knew the danger of religion. Uh, you know, that's one thing that is true that the world says, much of the world says, that we can agree with. Religion, religion is damning. It's, it's troubling. It's, it's caused a lot of wars. It's caused a lot of problems. But a relationship with Christ has never caused any problems. It's called you to be more like Christ and more like the son or daughter God created you to be. Religion is disastrous. But a real true relationship with Christ, it's real. Paul, he said, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. 
He was like an army ranger of the Pharisees. So those 600 laws that they built in, they made, and they made everybody try to keep up with them. He's the one that went and enforced them and said, you better do this, and went to houses to instruct people to do it. He's like the army ranger of Pharisees. He said, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And then he came to Christ, and he looked back at that religious time of his life, and you know what he called it? He called it dung. He said, it's like cow manure now. He said, I can't believe that that was what grabbed my heart. Now, Paul uses an interesting word here, verse 18. He said, you approve what is excellent. <clears throat> so that word approve, it means to examine in the light. So in that day, if you bought a vase or something that was important, you'd take it outside because of no electricity. You'd put it out to the sun you'd turn it around and examine it and see if it's real, if it's genuine, if it's valid. He said, I wish you would take your faith. I wish you'd take your confession. I wish you'd take your heart desires and examine it in front of the light, in front of the truth, and see if it's real and see if it's genuine. He said, then you'd be far less judgmental. You wouldn't be condemning others. Uh, you wouldn't want to be living in hypocrisy. You'd be confessing your sins quicker repenting, turning away from him, because you'd want to make Christ look glorious. That's his whole thing here. You would love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. The fifth word he talks about is blasphemy. So he's taking some big words here. And the fifth word here, blasphemy, it, it means to condemn God's nature, condemn God's name. You can take God and put the word damn or some other word with it, and you can commit blasphemy in some way. But the blasphemy that he's talking about is to say something that doesn't represent God while all the time acting like you represent God or doing something that doesn't represent God all the time saying you're representing God. So he says in verse 23, you're boasting in the law and you dishonor God by breaking the law. Verse 24, for it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, Pause for a moment and think what this means. He said, you're boasting that you're trying and you're great people and you're judging people and looking down on them and you're boasting about yourself that you're trying so hard is actually causing people to, to be confused and say, I don't understand. And you're blaspheming God's name because you're trying so hard. In other words, he says, I wish you'd start trusting in Christ and quit trying. I wish you'd be, have a relationship, a real relationship with God. And he's saying to some of them, if you do have a real relationship, it's time to stop boasting about your trying and how good you are. You know, all they had to do was, as Jewish people especially, was just pause and look at some of the Ten Commandments. I mean, it's, it's right there on your note sheet if you've got a note sheet. You shall have no other gods before me. Right, check, miss that one. Honor your father and your mother. You mean both of them? i got to honor both check, miss that one. You shall never murder. Don't hate someone bad enough that you like to see them have harm done to them. Miss that one. Don't commit adultery. Don't ever lust for anybody. It's not yours. Miss that one. Don't steal. Don't take anything that's yours. Uh, don't ever uh, mistreat uh, your boss or cheat him with your work. Uh, miss that one. My dad, my dad took me back to a store one time. I stole a candy bar. He found out about it, took me back, marched me back. I had to apologize and uh, give the guy some money. And for a while, when I'd come in the store, the guy would say, hey, I'm watching you. So I, I messed up there. Uh, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't say anything that's untrue about your neighbor that would make them look bad in the eyes of others. And don't covet. Don't wish you had something that somebody else had. Check, check, check. Missed them. So he said, if you really look at yourself, you'd realize how much you need God's grace. And you'd want to preach God's grace to other people. Verse 25, circumcision, he said, now think of Jewish religious terms or just religious rituals like being baptized as an infant, going through confirmation class, maybe being baptized or just doing certain rituals or certain things that say, this is what God wants. He said, if indeed it was a value, it would be if you kept the law. He said, that's okay if you get circumcised, if you really truly could keep all the laws of God. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Now, that doesn't seem like much in our culture, but let me explain. Circumcision was that you circumcise the organ of the body where you're passing on the DNA of Adam to remind yourself you're a sinner and you need God's grace. 
And he said, some of you have become circumcised and you've become less gracious to people who fall short. He said, that doesn't work. He said, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. You become just like the, the Gentiles that you put down, just like those people, us and them, that we put down. He said, you're just becoming just like them. Verse 28, no one is a Jew who's merely one outwardly, that circumcision is outward and physical. So Jesus said you could peel the bark off a tree, but it's still a tree. No, no circumcision done by hand can change the heart. And may I remind you, Jesus said there's only one blasphemy that can never be forgiven. That's a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So what is that? Well, the Holy Spirit's guide, uh, our job in life, is to guide you to Jesus Christ, to point out Christ and his work on the cross. So if you reject this witness today and the witness in your heart and your conscience, that's the only blasphemy that can never be forgiven. If you die rejecting what the Holy Spirit and God the Father says about Jesus Christ coming to earth, <clears throat> dying for your sins, raising again to save you, if you reject that, there's nothing that could save you. So Paul is reminding them, don't count in religious rituals or, or any circumcision or any baptism or any confirmation class or anything whatsoever. Count on a person. Count on a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Finally, transformation. Just say that to someone. He ends with how to be transformed. He says in verse 29, a Jew is one inwardly. So here's, here's all of this brought together. He said all these bragging all the bragging, external things, rituals, trying, being sincere, seeking to be a good person, doing your best for God, and then he'll approve of you. He said, it's all dung. It's all nonsense. But a true Jew is one that's one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart. He said, you need your heart circumcised, not your body. You need your old heart, your old nature taken away, and a new nature, Jesus Christ, placed inside of you. You need a new nature in your heart. He Notice in verse 29, he says, this one's done by the Holy Spirit, not by men, not by effort, not by religion, not by trying, not by the letter, not by reading something and going and doing your best to do it. He said, and then your praise will not be from man, but it'll be from God. You know, all religion is about pride. It's about what you can do for God and how people notice. All religion is about pride, arrogance. But humbly coming to Christ is saying, I want you and I want my praise to come from you. I want my approval to come from you. Save me, change me. I want to be approved in your eyes through your son that you gave for me at the cross, who raised for me. So you, you don't care so much about man's approval anymore. It's about God's approval. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 on your screen, he says, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. Think about that. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart so that you will love your God with all your heart and you may live. So all the way back in Deuteronomy, he said exactly what Jesus said when he came on earth. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbors, yourself. He said, how do I do that? You get your heart circumcised. You know what he's saying? You need to become a true Jew. A true Jew, even if you're a Gentile, you get grafted into the kingdom, one of Abraham's children, is one person who has given his life or her life to Jesus Christ and said, change my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Change my heart. Turn me around. I want to be yours. I want to belong to you. I want to have the love that you promised in my heart and in my life. Come in and live inside me. Circumcise my heart. Give me a new heart, a new nature. I repent. I repent of trying. I repent of what I've done. I repent of the way I was living. I trust in you. Philippians, Paul says it this way. It's we, we who've trusted in Christ, we're the true circumcision. We worship by the Spirit of God. We don't worship by trying or effort or good deeds. We, are, we worship God because His Spirit, His very Spirit lives inside of us. And what do we do? We glory in Christ Jesus. The word glory means weight, value. We think Christ is weighty. We value Him now. We used to value ourselves. We value Jesus Christ who gave His life for us. And we put no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in what we can do for God. It's all confidence in what God has done for us. You know, I was thinking, 
when uh, COVID came out, when it first came out, uh, Dr. Fauci and others said, uh, don't wear a mask, you know, don't touch your face. And one of the things he said was, he said, many people will touch their face and they'll end up getting sick because they had a mask and touched their face and they could even die. He said, you can even get the virus and die. And I was thinking, what a terrible thing that would be is to die and go to heaven. And the Lord say, well, you touched your face. <laughs> I mean, what, what would that be like? Like I've jumped out of two airplanes. I, I've fallen out of a two-story building. Uh, I've jumped off several cliffs into water. Uh, I even lived with a wife and two women and, and uh, two daughters and one bathroom. I mean, I've lived through a lot of stuff. And what if you died and you went there and God said, oops, you touched your face and got a virus. You know, there's so many things. And there, there's so many things out of your control. You know what Paul just said? It is absolutely out of your control to be good enough to earn God's approval. And that's why he sent his son. That's why Jesus Christ came and he lived the life, the perfect life that you were meant to live, I was meant to live, that I didn't live. That he died a death and took all the wrath of God, the righteousness of God. He died a death that I deserve, that I should pay the penalty for, but he paid my penalty and your penalty. He died for all your sins, all that will one day come out in the open. And he rose again to give you a new nature, a new life that you could never produce on your own. Not in a billion years, not in a quadzillion years. You could never produce the life that the resurrected Christ could produce inside of you. Are you religious or do you have a relationship with Christ? Do the people around you know? Do the people who know you the best, would they be able to say, you know what, he's not perfect, she's not perfect, but wow, what a change. I know Christ is in her. I know, I know he loves Christ. I know she loves the Lord now. Would they be able to say that? Because it, it would always bear fruit if you put your trust in Christ. I'm going to ask you wherever you are to pray and ask him, ask him to be the Lord of your life, to forgive you, to cleanse you, to come inside and live in you. And uh, tell someone, tell someone today, hey, I put my trust in Christ. Go public, be baptized. Don't be ashamed of Christ. Get in a church and start growing up in your faith. But tell someone today, I trust in Christ alone, nothing else. Father, thank you. Thank you that someone today got their life changed. They're moving from religion to a relationship. They trust in you alone through Christ Jesus. They trust in your grace. Father, I pray that we'd be a church that would help them grow up in their faith, grow up to be Christ-like, that we'd see Christ in them and encourage them. And Lord, they would be about your mission, your mission to proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere they go with their life and with their words. In Jesus' name, amen.